For more than a century and a half, Canada's residential schools inflicted astonishing suffering on Indigenous children and families from coast to coast to coast. A new project offers a way to see some of how that unfolded across the country. It's called the Residential Schools Land Memory Atlas. And with us now for more in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, Jackie Fletcher, residential school survivor and a member of the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association. In the nation's capital, Irene Barbeau, She's a residential school survivor and council member for the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association. And Stephanie Pine, who's a postdoctoral research fellow with the Residential Schools Land Memory Mapping Project at Carleton University. And we're glad that all of you could join us today. Obviously, we've got some bandwidth issues um, with, um, with Irene, so we're only going to be, um, we're going to be hearing Irene, but we're not necessarily going to be seeing her. Let's put up, if we can, Tony, have you got this standing by here? Just a screen grab of what the website looks like. There we go. Look at all of those dots and look how much penetration there was of residential schools across North America until not that very long ago. And Stephanie, I wonder if you could get us started here. How does the Memory Atlas work? Uh, thanks, Steve, for that question. Um, it, or, it's a long answer to explain how the entire atlas works. Um, it's more or less like a regular website where you click on points and get information. Um, if you go, go into the atlas, you'll be able to explore different maps. The map screenshot that you showed is from the residential schools map, and that map includes various layers on what we were looking at it also included communities near residential schools and universities near residential schools and different types of residential schools. So the best answer is just to click and explore and find your way around. And that's what I did last night, actually, Stephanie. I clicked in there and I just sort of, um, I'm not sure what the technical term is, but I noodled around for, for a good long time. And uh, there's a fascinating amount of information there. How did the project get started to begin with? The project started actually as part of another project called the Lake Huron Treaty Atlas project. And as part of my travels and engagements with people, I met the people at Shingwak Residential School Center and we decided collectively to include residential schools component in an atlas that was focused on treaties. And that makes sense because the residential school's legacy is part of the ongoing treaty relationship story as well. So the, uh, once that first atlas was finished, we decided to go forward with growing the residential school's atlas and residential school's component into an atlas of its own. And that was recognizing the many dimensions of the residential school's legacy itself. We have two people with us here who know all about that legacy and can give us firsthand testimony about that. So I want to ask them about that. Jackie, why do you think this project is so important? Um, it's important because we need the general public to understand what happened to us. We don't want this swept under the carpet. And we've been working at this for 27 years now as a volunteer myself, sitting on the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association we uh, we want to tell our story, and because of COVID nineteen, what a better way to tell it through this atlas? I think it's just a wonderful technology that we're using to be able to let the world know what happened to us as a people. It's been silent for too long. I guess the coronavirus does offer us, because we're spending so much time at home, the opportunity to to actually take the time to go onto our computers and look at this. And I, Irene, what is the story, as Jackie puts it, what's the story that you think we need to know that maybe a lot of us don't know? Um, yes, I think uh, this mapping project is very important to, to, Canada, uh, to Canada and all international community, because as you probably found out that Alcomiu is part of the residential school that I went to, Shinwak Residential School, they just expanded the, the building when it became a university. And when we started gathering there back the first time in 1981 and then the ne uh, and nine, nine, 1991, 
we decided that as a group of grassroots survivors to make something good out of what happened to us. And we were going to tell it from our perspective. So the first thing we decided was we were going to focus on education so that this topic of residential schools be done at the elementary, high school, college, and post-secondary institutions, and that the course be taught at all levels. And that took us 27 years to get into the classroom. And I'm now happy to say that it is being taught in the classrooms, because I do go to the classrooms as a guest speaker when the kids talk about talk about indigenous studies. So they actually see the face of a um, survivor that lived that experience. Jackie, I want to follow up with you on that if I can, because I have certainly read a number of books which have described the residential school situation as a horror show for some. And that I have talked to other indigenous people who say, you know, we know obviously of that history, but for me, it wasn't that bad. What was your experience? My experience uh, going to the residential school was terrifying. I had my my father had nine siblings, and I have eleven siblings. And when I went into residential school, I knew nothing about it. That's how secret that whole thing was. I have another point that I want to make, and I just realized yesterday that we're coming full circle in terms of institutionalizing our people. We, we uh, went into residential school as an institution, and now as we're getting older, our uh, elders are going into uh, homes. And I have a sister who started to regress back to when she was in residential school by being in this home. She said, you've got to be careful here that the matron doesn't hear you. So You're there's talking another about a long-term care home, I guess, eh? Yes, I am. And I just realized that yesterday that that's what's happening to us all over again. Hmm. So you not only uh, experienced the indignity of residential schools back in the day, but your, your family, your ancestors, uh, your descendants are experiencing some of that today in long-term care homes. Am I hearing you correctly? The descendants are, are the ones that went before me but didn't tell us what it was all about. It was kept such a secret. The long, ter long care term homes I, I'm talking about is my siblings who went there that that are at this age. They're, they were in their 80s, late 80s, and they really started to feel the effects again of residential school being in there and institutionalized. I hope I, I hope that's clear. It is. I understand. Yes, indeed. Irene, could you tell me about your experience in the residential school setting? Uh, yes, I um, I went to two residential schools. The first one was Horton Hall in Moose Factory, Ontario. And after I was going into grade seven, I had to go to Sault Ste. Marie Shinwalk to do grade seven and eight. And from there, I went to high school and graduated in 1963. But however, I must say that I, I feel like I'm one of the people that actually had a good experience in that I was not physically or mentally or uh, abused or sexually. However, I did have some impacts from that. Um, from being in there at both schools where the impact is that being the oldest of six kids, I never truly bonded with my younger siblings. And also I was disconnected from my uncles, aunties, grandmas on both sides of my family. And as, uh, and it's a known fact that, that indigenous people, families are very close together, just like the Italians. Like we travel in groups. So to be taken away from there and all, also, I hear the community said it was a very sad time in September when the kids went away because we couldn't hear any kids playing outside or laughing and doing what kids do when they play outside. It affected the community as well and, of course, the parents. Hmm. I know my, father, my mom told me that when it was time to go, all she could do was stop, pull herself from crying until the plane took off and then she went to her bed and just literally collapsed there until my father had to come into the room and say, Agnes, pull yourself together because you have other children in the home that need you. 
that's how bad it was for my mother. Jackie, maybe you could follow up on that because again, I have heard that that um, First Nations parents did not have the option that um, that they were obliged to put their children in residential schools. I heard I have heard other accounts which said they did have a choice and could do it or didn't have to do it if they didn't want to. What was your experience? Uh, my experience, I came from a little community called La Calche, Ontario, which was on the railroad, railroad town. And uh, there was only about maybe 10 kids in the classroom from grade kindergarten right up to grade eight. And we couldn't get the really good teachers coming there. And a lot of us were just fooling around and playing all the time. So, uh, my mom and dad were very concerned about the education. They knew I needed an education, so that's why they put my sister and I into the residential school. But it was terrifying for us. I I never saw such a big building like that in my life. And as soon as we, as soon as my parents left and after they dropped us off, they took my younger sister to a different dorm than than I was, and we were very confused about why that was happening and she was crying and I had no way to protect her. That's what bothered me the most in that school was uh, being separated from my sister. And for how long a period of time would you not have seen your parents, for example? Well, we, we were allowed to go home during the summer. So for the rest of the year, you were where you were? I, I think at Christmas time, my parents came to Sault Ste. Marie to see us but we, we didn't go back home until the summer. Right. Stephanie, so it let me was get really, you. It was very difficult to deal with your emotions because you didn't know what the emotions were doing. You know, you're missing your people and you're missing your friends, your family, your community, the way you ate, everything. It was changed. Hmm. It was a complete paradigm shift. Stephanie, let me get you back into this and, 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 and ask you this question. Um, there has been a lot of discussion over the last many years about reconciliation uh, between Indigenous people in this country and everybody else. Do you have hopes that if this project takes off and that if people dive into it and get a greater understanding of the history, that it could do something for reconciliation? Uh, yes, I I do believe that it's already been happening through the work we intersect with and in the product in the work so far to create what is there in the atlas and content that remains to be added. Uh, one example is how as a contract instructor I've incorporated the atlas uh, into the curriculum. So you'll see in the introduction and background page where there's reference to sketch maps and summaries and reflections of news stories. All of that content was created by fourth year social work students and iSchool students at the University of Toronto, iSchool referring to information. Um, so there's a, quite a growing awareness already that I'm aware of in the, in the collaborative work to create the Atlas. And then when it comes to the intersecting projects, uh, Shingwap Residential School Center, which is like the sibling of Children of Shingwap Associ uh, Alumni Association has been working with us and they also engage people in the creation of knowledge and in exposure to knowledge when it comes to stories and the history of the Shingwap site. And there are others, the Assiniboia Residential School Legacy Group in Winnipeg, working with the University of Manitoba and National Center for Truth and Reconciliation are all ongoing initiatives that have many different manifestations related to reconciliation. So, hmm. so it's quite a good national that the, the snowball is starting to roll and grow, I'd say. And sometimes it's summertime when that snowball is rolling and growing. So it <laughs> doesn't <laughs> seem to get so big so fast. So that's what I like to keep on going and staying with my friends in the snowball. <laughs> mm -hmm. so let me ask you this, Stephanie, because, uh, you know, as I was noodling around on the site last night, uh, I, I think, and you'll help me with the name if I've got it wrong, is it E.F. Walker, who was one of the, one of the people who uh, ran one of the schools? E.F. Wilson. Wilson, yeah. And Wilson, I'm not sure Walker. That the yeah. Irene, Wilson, yeah, yeah, Irene and 
Jack, you're very familiar with that name. Okay. The originating principal of the original Shinglock School. Irene, tell me about that person because, um, you know, some of what was said on, on the site, um, you know, was rather praiseworthy of this person. And it might come as a surprise to uh, non-Indigenous people who are exploring the website themselves that, it, I mean, it's not, it's not all awful news all the time. Is that fair to say? I didn't go to, to St. Marie until 1958. All I have heard about him is what uh, Professor Don Jackson wrote about in documents that he had prepared in the history of the center. When I say center, I'm talking about the uh, residential school center at Algoma U. So I'm not familiar with a lot of how he could be praised. I remember Don Jackson saying that he was the one that got everything started in terms of um, setting up the residential schools and working with the local people at Garden River, which is a reserve just outside of Sault Ste. Marie, and that he worked with the local chief there. And I believe at one time they walked to Toronto from Sault Ste. Marie to get the funding to get that building started in St. Marie and it was supposed to it was named at one time that teaching with one I don't know if any of that information was on that that map that you were googling maybe it's not part of the details yet so that's all I know of Mr. Wilson uh, he was a um, an Anglican person and got friendly with the local Ojibwe people Right, but Stephanie, he had an indigenous name as well, right? Which suggested, anyway, it suggested, um, well, you tell me. Yeah, there's more to the story, definitely. That the map is, is being updated, let's say, and done in a more consistent way. Originally, it was an exploratory map to gather everything that we could find that was about, uh, reflecting Wilson's life and journey. So what I do know about Yip Wilson is that he was a man of his time when it came to operating under the accepted assumptions of the day, including assumptions about Christianity. Um, he worked with the son of Chief Shingwak or Shingwakons, who was known for something called Shingwak's vision of education, and that vision involved educating his people in the new ways of the newcomers at the same time educating them about their own ways and this could extend to all people so ef wilson came to work with chief shingwak's son uh, who also was a chief and at the original early days of the school um it's it's it would be complicated to judge wilson for being either good or bad. I, I wouldn't say that the Atlas praises him. It's starting to document his journey to understand better. Yeah. And another thing I know, just to try to wrap it up quickly, is that through E.F. Wilson's journeys across North America, learning about other approaches to residential schools like the American boarding schools and working really at the forefront of the creation of these schools, he became disillusioned over time. He retired to Salt Spring Island and he... There, there are records where he is sorry about the way it turned out already. This is what I mean. Time. It's a more, it's a very, it's a more nuanced look at history than people might suspect at first blush. So I, I just basically wanted to get that on the record. Jackie, I've got about a minute left here and I want to ask you, you know, Sunday is National Indigenous Peoples Day and it's an opportunity for people to think about, um, well, you know what, maybe I should ask you, what would you like people to think about this weekend in honor of that day? I hope that people of our Aboriginal people are watching this program because we need the younger generation to come on board now. We're all aging very quickly, as everybody knows what age is like, and we're getting tired now of doing, trying to keep this uh, program going. We need the young blood, and we're, I'm sending out an appeal to all the younger generations of people to become involved. That's what I would like to see. Well, I have to say to both Jackie and Irene, you don't seem like you're slowing down at all. I, I feel a lot of energy coming from both of you here. We're still going, but we need help. I get yeah, you. Yeah, we I do. Get. We get, 
we get energized by interviews like this. And mm -hmm. I want uh, just a quick uh, suggestion. You might want to do um, a program on reclamation of the Rin of the Shinwak Indian Residential School. That's another project we're doing very, very um, in earnest with the university. So I think that would be an excellent program for you to focus on uh, later on next year or so. You've got okay. your marching Great. orders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got my marching orders, indeed. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, we should point out that, that uh, obviously the relationship with Algoma University is very tight, and they're, they're a big part of this. Uh, Stephanie Pine, Irene Barbeau, Jackie Fletcher, it's really good of all of you to join us on TVO tonight, and we wish you a great good fortune with this Residential Schools Land Memory Mapping Project. Take care, all. Nice to talk to you, Steve. Thank I always you. saw you on TV, never got a chance to converse with you. Yeah, and, keep on and would you say would you say the experience is, is very overrated at the end of the day or what? No, it's no. good. It's good. No. Okay. I think we could use another 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.